Hey everybody and welcome to another week and another episode of Big League Bourbon. Today we bring on J.D. Klosser, a former Major League Baseball player who got his break in the Major Leagues with the Colorado Rockies, was drafted in the fifth round of the 1998 draft by the Arizona Diamondbacks, and has spent the last six years of his career coaching with the Yankees in the minor league systems before he came, the minor league catching coordinator for two years, and he currently has taken the same position with the Atlanta Braves. So tonight, we're going to bring on JD. And for the second week in a row, we have somebody who made it here with no technical difficulty and was on time. Welcome, JD. Hey, JD, how's it going tonight? Good. How y'all doing tonight? Fantastic. <clears throat> so, JD, we're in the middle of the season, man. How's it going? Uh, now that we're going, it's good. I wasn't sure, honestly, um, when we got started, especially the minor leagues, if we were ever really going to start. Um, I knew the major league teams were probably going to get their stuff in, but as far as whether or not the minor leagues were going to start, nobody was really sure. So um, really excited that we are, and it's good to see our players back out on the field and actually getting to do what we all love to do so much. And that's play the game and compete and see where this thing takes them. That's awesome. Yeah. So now all the levels are going all the way through, correct? Yes. Um, everybody started at the same time at the beginning of May in the minor leagues, uh, triple a actually broke camp when the major leaguers did, but they were considered an alternate site for the first month of the season. So they were basically having a, 30 man spring training at the alternate sites while the major league teams were playing. So players would be available to go help them out. But everybody's been playing. I think all of our affiliates have played uh, somewhere in the vicinity of 70 ish games. Nice. Nice. So on the way to the all-star break, most of yes. them, correct? Well, <clears throat> yes, this year though, because we started late, there will not be any all-star breaks in each league. They will just have the major league break and that'll be it because they're just oh, okay. to make sure that they get the games in. They're not actually having any, any breaks that are at the uh, lower at the minor leagues this year. Oh, okay. Right on. So how I'm going to ask you this, cause this is different this year. This is the first year that we've had the contraction of the minor leagues where we lost, I want to say 42 teams and <clears throat> everybody, got refined. So everybody's got the same levels all the way through their systems. How did that affect, say, a spring training for the first time when you're starting to see a smaller amount of guys in? Uh, well, I think it affected spring training in that we probably, and I think a lot of organizations probably decided to push some guys to levels a little faster, um, just for the fact that there's not a short season clubs really anymore so i think some guys probably got pushed to levels that they may not necessarily been pushed to in a normal year but it's been good i mean spring training actually was fairly normal for the most part it was actually nice to have the entire facility i'd have to share it with the major league team while we were doing ours because they were already gone so we had tons of space to do everything and it was it was nice to have all that time Nice. Now, would you say you've seen or witnessed a different sense of urgency with some of the players now that there's been the contraction and we've seen some guys not be invited back? I think so. I do think players, um, probably rightfully so, or feel like they have to go now. Um, you know, especially some of the guys that are I mean, I say older guys. I mean, we all know that mid to mid twenties is old in the game now that are haven't played in a year and a half. I think that you can see a little bit of a sense of urgency and sometimes some pressing from them to try and speed up their progress, which can be hindering at times, you know, when you're not necessarily taking advantage of where you are, it, it can and you're looking ahead all the time, it can definitely hurt your hurt your output. Mm-hmm. Yeah, pressing is never good. We we've, we've all been there, and all realized. Uh, hopefully, hopefully, most of us realize sooner than later when the pressing <laughs> happens that it's time to uh, take the foot off the gas a little bit and uh, reboot the system. Otherwise, you get in that long slump and you're in the it's minors. Terrible. That might be the end of it. For you. <laughs> you know, it could I've, be. I've seen you guys with, do it. 
Exactly, especially with not playing for an entire year. I mean, you're going to have the draft coming up here in, what, three or four days, and you're going to get a new group mm-hmm. of players in and international players. And it's – I definitely think that, uh, you know, some players feel pressure to perform, and hopefully they understand that we realize they haven't played in a year and a half either. So we, we you know, it's – it's hard to do that. I know as a player, we always want to impress and we're always not, we don't think anybody knows how tough it is, but honestly, we, we realize it. Yeah, definitely. Now, like you said, the draft is coming up this year. We're going from last year's 10 rounds to this year. We're doing 20, correct? Last year was five rounds. Last year was five. And this this yes. year's 20. Yeah. Uh, yes. I believe so, this year is 20. Yeah. I know that it's been bouncing around back and forth, but I believe they settled on 20. Now, in years past, we had 50 rounds, and before that, before our time, they had the draft until teams decided not to draft anymore. You know, so we'd see 70s or 80s sometimes with some teams. But with that be said, you know, last year, odd year with only the five rounds. This year, there's only 20. So there's only 20 guys, per se, coming in. Is that going to affect rosters the way it used to with guys getting released after the draft as uh, prevalent as it used it, to be? Or are we just going to see guys heading to the DL because you can kind of hide some guys more on the DL this year? Um, I, I think that it will happen some, but I think overall, I mean, I just would find it hard for the draft being in the middle of July. We bring players in that we draft. You know, it takes, say it takes four or five days to sign them. You get them in and get their physicals. You're looking at the almost the end of July before they actually get into camp. And most of these guys haven't played since May or June. So you have to build them up again. Now you're looking at mid to late August and you really only have a couple of weeks left in the season. So it's almost like, do we insert these guys into games now and try to get them built up or do we just bring them in and get them into the system and get them working out and get them back in shape a little bit? I think that's going to be a debate that a lot of organizations have uh, of how they handle their draft guys. Do they send any guys out to start playing anywhere? Uh, position players probably a lot easier to do than a pitcher. Um, right. It, you know, but all these guys are – with massively increased workloads from what they had the year before too, because a lot of places were cut short for the COVID in 2020. So I think it's going to be a fine mm-hmm. line. It'll be interesting to see how, how everybody handles it. I'm not sure how we're going to handle it. Yet. I don't, we haven't had any of those conversations, but I, I, I don't know. I think it'd be interesting to see how, how it goes. I mean, I think we can put them in our complex league and it, they don't, they have unlimited rosters down there so we can kind of have them down there working out. I don't know. It'd be, it'll be interesting to see. Yeah. Well, that be said, as a minor league catching coordinator, it's got to be pretty exciting that you have one of the best guns in the game sitting in Mississippi right now. <laughs> it is. You want to tell uh, us a little bit about the about the man who's <laughs> becoming legendary as he's already gunned out 19 guys this season? And uh, why are they stealing on him still? That's a great question, but every time I go there to watch him play, I sure pray that they do run because it is really fun to watch him throw. And uh, the guy's name is Shay Langoliers. He was our, I want to say, 12th pick overall or something like that for us in 2019 out of Baylor. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm telling you, it is – I've seen a lot of guys throw in my day, and uh, he might be one of the best I've ever seen because he's got a really good arm. He's got great quickness, and his accuracy is unbelievable. So, I mean, he – you see a lot of guys that have good arms or they can get rid of the ball, but very seldom do you see guys that can do all three. And he is really fun to watch back there, especially when guys take off and run. And I didn't know that until the other day. I knew he threw a lot of guys out, but I didn't know until I saw on, you know, the Twitter sphere the other day that he was leading the minor leagues. And I went back and looked and it's pretty good. I want to say it's like 56% or something like that. Yeah. I went and watched the highlight tape and I was just sitting there. Going, <laughs> it was, I mean, I wanted we were, to throw to were, that guy. Oh man. They were, I was there watching him play Birmingham about three weeks ago and he blocked the ball and the guy tried to take off on the, uh, on the pitch and he threw the guy out. And I, you know, you didn't think that, but you see it all the time from him and watch the video later in the side view of the hitter as uh as he threw it and he threw the guy out the hitters backing out and he looks back at him and he just goes oh 
my. It was just, <laughs> <laughs> it's crazy. It's, awesome. it's fun to watch. Yes. Yeah. When you have a special player like that, it, it makes the game very enjoyable to see. That's for Yes, sure. and you just try to stay out of his way and not screw him up. <laughs> <laughs> Amen to that. <laughs> Amen to that. Oh, yeah. That's that's one of the things that can happen in different organizations. Um, I think every organization's been through that with a prospect or two or 20 or 30 or more. Just saying. Um, <laughs> when they try to make guys change. So, amen to that. Yes. So, let's, let's dive into your playing background and then we'll work our way back into the coaching side of things. So... You went from a state championship in 98 in Indiana to playing in the minor leagues. How was that adjustment for you? Um, honestly, it's what I always wanted to do. So I don't know that I, I, I didn't really seem like that big of a deal at the time. Um, I went to the Arizona fire league right away. Um, played there and, you know, I played with obviously a bunch of guys that were similar age and it just kind of seemed like, a continuation of just playing. Um, it, it, I never really felt like it was a huge jump or anything like that. Leave, you know, um, leaving the nest or whatever you want to call it. I, I, I had done a lot of stuff growing up, you know, being away some, so it wasn't a big deal mm-hmm. doing that. And I don't know. I just, I mean, it's always what I always wanted to do. So it was never, for me, I never felt like it was a crazy big leap to go do that. Right on. So once you were there, you started out in Arizona. You worked your way up through the systems. Um, what year did you move over to the Colorado system? Uh, I was traded to Colorado in January of 2002. Okay. So I was there from then, 2002 to 2006. Okay. And right then... So you didn't put you on waivers some... and I've been to the, yeah, mm-hmm. lots of, all. Yeah. I've done it all in the game, you know, released waivers, traded, you name it. I did it. That's awesome. Now, who'd you get traded for? Uh, myself and Jack Cust were traded to the Rockies for Mike Myers, left-handed specialist. Okay. The sidearm, sidearm lefty. He's actually yep. involved in the major league baseball players association. Now he's actually on the board there and all that. So Fantastic. So that's fun coming across. So in the minors, you know, you made the transition from coming to high school to straight to professional baseball, working behind the dish, one of the most intense places that you can be. You're involved in every single pitch, the whole game. What was it like and who are the coaches that helped mold you into the player that you became? Um, I, I, I think as far as catching goes, a couple of guys come to mind early on when I was in Arizona, um, Don Wakamatsu was a guy that, you know, um, just was tried to help me relax a lot with a lot of the stuff. And I think, like you said, getting into the game, um, coming from Indiana, it's not like it was Florida or California or Texas where you're seeing tons and tons of guys that are professional quality players. You don't really see a lot of that. So, I think there were times where as a guy coming in, a young kid, like you said, out of high school, you get amped up and anxious and walk was really good about teaching you to just breathe and relax and do all of that. Um, But as far as a lot of the other stuff, I think I would have to credit uh, Todd Green, the teammate that I had in Colorado as a guy that really helped me just mold into understanding how to be a, a major leaguer and a professional and, how to handle myself and represent myself in the organization and the game as a whole and all of that. And um, those are probably two of the big ones. Um, and then, yeah, I mean, when I was with the Dodgers at the end of my career, Travis Barbary was really a good guy and helped me out a lot and kind of just in other ways, not necessarily as much catching wise. Cause at that point I was, you know, 29, 30 years old and I had been around a little bit. So it was just kind of helping out in other ways that, um, you know, just, as how to be a leader and things like that. Right on. Mike Stahl here brought up a good comment here. You, when you said Mike Myers, and he's right about this, he said he thinks he owns 291 bourbon out of Colorado. 
Mike, that is true. Mike Myers is the founder and the owner of 291 Bourbon. We have to get him on the show. Bourbon and baseball, big league bourbon. Right. Come on. Mike, work on that. You're in Colorado. Let's get this done, my friend. Mike's been hitting up the Colorado distillers and getting it going. So he's from uh, out in Colorado. So I need to get him going with that one for me there. That would, that would be fun. That'd be fun. So as you said, you played in a bunch of different organizations throughout your career. What was the best organization to play in as far as being a player? Um, when I was working for him, a lot of people, I think, thought that I said it just because I worked for, worked for him at the time. But the Yankees and the way that they treated us as players and as people uh, was, was probably the best experience I had with that. Um, obviously, I can't discredit the time I had in Colorado. It was the opportunity I got to play in the big leagues. And, you know, I really enjoyed my time with the Dodgers. But as far as the way the organizations were ran and how things happened, the Yankees were unbelievable. Um, it's the first time, and I mean, it's little things I know. It's the first time I had ever, I was in triple air. Um, you know, the organization bought you bats as a player, whatever bats you wanted to get. And I'd never heard of that before. Um, yeah. And actually, when I got released there, they was the first time I'd ever, when I had been, re- it wasn't the first time I was released, but it was the first time when I had been released that I was ever just told, look, we're sorry, we don't have a spot here for you anymore, instead of just beating around the bush and sugarcoating it and things like that. So I just felt like the way things were handled and the way they treated us more as men as opposed to commodities and like children just kind of telling you what you wanted to hear and what they thought you wanted to hear, that to me, that was a huge, huge thing. That's awesome. And that is huge. Um, Shane Long asked, what high school did you attend in Indiana? Uh, Alexandria High School, Alexandria Monroe High School. Right you guys won the 2A state championship, correct? Yes, it was the first year of class sports in Indiana. Right on. That had to be a pretty exciting time. So win the state championship, so. go straight from there to play in minor league baseball, maybe a little legion in between. But back then there wasn't much time in between. No, season. actually it wasn't. I mean, we went so in Indiana, as you know, being from Illinois, like I think our state yeah. tournament ended June 25th or 26th. So there was not any time really in between. I think we ended on, like a Saturday was the state finals. And then, you know, they were in, in our house Monday or Tuesday working out and trying to figure out. And I think I was flying out Thursday or something. So, I mean, it was not much time in between to go out and, and do it. Yeah. Right on. Yeah. I remember those days. I remember there was draft day and then 10 AM the next day I had our area scout at my house and I was in a car the next day heading out to Erie, Pennsylvania. So exactly. It does happen the very, very fast. Yeah. yeah. I think so. The draft was probably a little bit before, because like I said, we didn't end until the middle of June. And at that time, I want to say the draft was like the second Tuesday in June or something like that. Yep. So yep. the draft happened and then the state tournament and it was the same thing. I, they actually, I actually went to South Bend when I signed because there was an exhibition game that the major league club was playing against our a ball club. I don't, I mean, nice. why they played exhibition games in the middle of the year. I have no idea. I mean, I don't think anybody would ever do that now, but 25 years ago they did. So I went there yeah. for the exhibition game and then went to uh, the Arizona rookie league. Nice. So out of all the teams you played for and all the cities you played in, What's the best city that you played in? Oh, Nashville, hands down. That's an easy one. <laughs> if you're talking about in the minor leagues. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. Yes. Definitely. I, I think I think Nashville, I mean, it's it's an incredible city to go to. I mean, everything about it. Other than at the time the stadium, but they've got a new stadium there now, so which I've heard is nice. But yeah, that uh, was, the locker room. I've talked about that locker room before on this on this channel because the Pirates <laughs> had Nashville originally, and I went up there, and yeah. I couldn't believe how tiny that locker room was, and having to walk sideways right when you got in there, you know, before it opened up. Some I, I was amazed yeah. the AAA locker room could be that small. 
I have been there times where it's rained hard enough that it's flooded and you've had to put two by fours down to walk across the dugout to get to the clubhouse. Yep. It is a, it was a thing of beauty there. Yeah. Yeah. The town definitely made up for it. But that <laughs> new stadium time. they have now, <laughs> that I thing's seems amazing. Incredible. It seems like it, it. does. It does. Now that be said, we've heard, we've heard the best one. What was the worst one you played in? Um, probably Clinton, Iowa. It was the lumber Kings. Oh man. I tell you what, you would get off the bus and it smelled so bad because of the dog food factory. That's right there. The dugouts were awful. The clubhouse was awful. You had a power line running over left field towards left center. And I'm pretty sure if you'd have jumped into the wall, the metal wall, you would have gotten tetanus because it was all curled up in different places and brutal, brutal. Uh-huh. brutal. And I, I mean, I, yeah, even, some of the- that's even counting like the, you know, rookie leagues and all that stuff. And there's some crappy places in the rookie leagues too. And I think Clinton, yeah. Iowa takes the, takes the cake when I think a lot of people will say that too. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, some of those some of those stops in the Midwest League back in the day were definitely not somewhere you wanted to be. Correct. Rockford was one of those too. I'm in the Rockford yeah. area. If, if you ever got to play there, I'm not sure if you did. We're no, they were infield. Out of the they were, infield they were is out about of the here, and then all of a sudden it drops like that to the outfield. I heard that, but they were yeah they were out of the league. Um, I think in. 99 I was there in the Midwest League and I think they were still in the league in 99 but I never went there I got sent back to the Pioneer League before and in 2000 I'm pretty sure that they were not in the league anymore it was they had moved to Dayton Yeah yeah it sounds about right but yeah I I grew up playing at that stadium If you were playing in the infield and had to go back on a ball that went to the outfield you literally went down the ramp uh, I had heard stories was, about that it, that's terrible it was, it was bad, and it was it was definitely one of those places where if you hit the wall, it was wood, but it was rotted out. You would go through it. You would <laughs> like straight cra- up, like, you would have went like through crash. that wall. Just like Rodney McRae yes. going through the wall in Buffalo. Yes, yeah. He, he could have done that, and instead of kind of getting hung up on the wall, he would have just kept on running down to the river there. <laughs> Oh, nice. It was it was special, put it that way. You know, I was glad to see them build a new stadium. They got a uh, independent league team for a while with the uh, Frontier League, and uh, now that's become part of the Northwoods League. So, oh, okay, that's a college league, right? Yeah. Northwoods. Yes. Yes. Yep. And they they get to play in some of those great Iowa stadiums you brought up, like uh, Waterloo and Dubuque, and I believe Clinton's in there now. So nice. Yeah, yeah. So the college guys get to experience that awesomeness we used to get. Everybody to see. should experience so, that. Why, you know, why wouldn't you? Yeah, definitely. So, in your time in the minors, what was the craziest thing you've seen on or off the field? Um, huh. I want to say I forget where we we had to be. Maybe in Quad Cities when we were there. And another Midwest League story. We had a guy who was like the biggest penny pincher in the history. Uh, I, he's the only guy I've ever met in my life that actually made money in low A ball. Yeah. Tell me about it. So is that possible? It is when you eat generic cornflakes and ramen noodles and don't spend, you know, that's, and you go and you get, you go to Wendy's and get the, uh, double, you know, the double, double for, or whatever, what's it called? Yeah. The double, whatever it is and double stack, it's for a dollar. It double stack back then or yeah, something double stack, for yeah, thirty nine. Exactly. And that's what he did. And so he, we were, we got some money together. I must've been, I don't know how much, maybe a hundred, hundred fifty dollars with a bunch of guys. And we might, might or might not have had, consume some alcoholic beverages prior to this happening. I'm not going to go there, but we dared, we, he swore he could swim across the river. And uh, we we're like, we're, we don't think that's a very good idea. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and, on the Quad uh, Cities. 
I, I swear, I, I, I want to say it was Quad Cities, but maybe it was somewhere in, anyway. And if it was sure the Quad enough, Cities, he's trying to go across the Mississippi River. I know, I know. What I don't. I don't think I don't. Anyway, it was a big river. It might not have been Quad City. It might have been Burlington or somewhere. Where, you know, it was a little bit smaller section of it. But he jumps in and starts going and gets about a third of the way out there and decides it's ba- it's a bad idea. <laughs> Turns around and comes back and you know his feet are cut up from the rocks under at the bottom when he's going in and all kinds of stuff. And I would say that's probably the, one of the crazier things that I saw a teammate try to attempt. Yeah, there there were definitely some guys along the way. Um, for me, more so in college than in uh, pro ball, that would uh, do some pretty crazy stuff in attempts to make some extra money on the road. Whether yes. they blew their meal money or lost everything on the back of the bus playing cards or whatnot. Yeah, I saw some crazy stuff like that too. So we have. Mike Stahl asked a question, our Colorado guy. If you were in a pickup softball game and Todd Helton and Will Clark were the only first baseman to choose from, who would you pick? And no wrong answer. For me, that's an easy one, Todd Helton. Teammate, um, really good guy. Uh, when I lived in Colorado, we lived down the street from each other. Um, wish I would stayed in touch with him more, but uh, – he, I, it would be easy for me. That'd be, that would be an easy one for me. I think that's a no brainer. We would, you know, we would go to the airport together and all that stuff. So that was a good one, but funny Todd Helton story. So we, we were in Cleveland and I sucked. Like I literally was awful in the big leagues at this time. And we were in Cleveland. And like I said, I was terrible. And Todd always had his own bats and his own little bat humidor that he carried around. And I swear those things were lead pipes just wrapped in some sort of wood lacquer because it was unbelievable how hard they were. So mm-hmm. we're in the clubhouse and he just, for some reason, one of his bats was sitting out. And so it was early and I went over and I grabbed one. And I kind of felt it just to see what it was, you know, what it felt like or whatever. And when I put it back down and I walked over to my chair, after I put it back down, he stands up, walks right behind me, grabs the bat, throws it right in the trash and never uses it again. I'm like, hmm, all right, perfect. <laughs> <laughs> a little superstition That's, going on there for sure. Just a little, just a little bit. Hell yeah, man. <laughs> if baseball isn't superstitious, nothing is, I'm telling you. Correct. So that be said, we get into the superstition part of this, man. What were some of the craziest superstitions you saw guys have along the way or you still see to this day? Um I mean I superstitions I, I would call it more routine than superstitions i think you know i think that's that's how we view it anyway but mm-hmm. uh i don't know i mean i think it was always one of those things where you know a guy would you know wear the same clothes in the field every day and you know when he was doing well or actually one of the ones that i saw was when i was in the california league um chris snelling was an outfielder with the mariners pretty big prospect actually he mm-hmm. um was scuffling at the time and he got his hands on some pair of cleats that were like 1940s ish type cleats where they were like straight flat bottoms, probably like two, two and a half spikes on them, just whatever. Yeah. Right. And he absolutely starts going off and he has, I want to say it's somewhere in the range of like a 25 to 30 game hit streak wearing these spikes ends up breaking his foot because he's wearing these crappy spikes. <laughs> but so I would have to say that's probably one of the biggest superstitions I've seen a guy have is wears these old, old, old school spikes and start raking and wear them enough that he actually hurt himself because he was wearing those spikes. And that's crazy. <laughs> that's absolutely crazy. <laughs> Jason Busey's popping in. He's asking this question for you. Mike Piazza or Johnny Bench? Ooh. I wish I would have seen Johnny Bench play actually in person. Although, because of that, I'd, I'd have to say Mike just because he was in a rehab in 2006. 
07, he was rehabbing mm -hmm. and I was in AAA with the A's at the time. So he was coming to get some at bats. He was rehabbing his shoulder. He couldn't throw, but he was trying to get his swing ready to go to get back to the big leagues. And he hit a ball that must have been a 92 hopper to the shortstop. And he hauled ass all the way to first base in a AAA rehab game, 16 years in the big leagues, 5 billion homers. And he still, and so for me, I gained a ton of respect for him for doing that. So Mike Piazza. That's awesome. So I'm going to transition that question over. Who is a player that you were able to play with at any point of your career that was the best or most talented player you played with? And it doesn't have to be somebody who made it because we all know there's guys who have unbelievable talent, who don't make it all the way. And some of those are the greatest stories we'd love to hear, but never hear. Oh, man. The best player, most talented player. Wow. Um, Hmm. It's hard to remember all the guys that I played with, to be honest with you. Right. Uh, to, to have one that sticks out. Um, hmm. I don't know that there's one that necessarily sticks out that did. Golly, that's a, I should have an answer to that question, to be quite honest with you. Who's the most talented player? I don't know. I mean, you know what? I guess if you're going to go, he probably didn't have the power tool as much as everybody else, but D. Gordon was probably the most athletically gifted player that I ever played with in the minor leagues. Okay. Right on. So how would that compare with guys you played with in the major leagues? And I'm going to ask that question because Todd Helton was a hell of an athlete coming from being the quarterback at University of Tennessee as well as their first baseman and a pitcher. It was a very yes. successful pitcher. So I'm just going to throw that one out there. I mean, I know D is amazingly talented and had a very storied amateur career before he played professional. So this, this is a fun question for me to ask. I, I think if you're going pure athletic ability, I think it was D. But if you're going to go as far as like skills of everything, I think hands down Todd is – one of the most skilled guys I ever saw. I've you very, I've never really saw, and I don't think you really see a lot of guys that in one at bat can hit a ball that almost hits on the left field foul line. And then the next pitch hit a ball that hits almost on the right field foul line and just be able to control what he was doing so well. It, it was a really impressive thing to see on a day in and day out basis. I think that he gets, dinged a little bit because he spent his career in Colorado, but Todd could really freaking play. And it didn't, I, it wouldn't have mattered where he played. He still would have been a great player. Um, obviously I think, you know, it sucks that he gets dinged a little bit because of Colorado, but I think he also Larry did too. Larry Walker also did too, Right. but he still made the hall of fame. So. Mm -hmm. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to twist that into another question. Now with the analytics going on and we've got shifts and we have, you know, books for scouting reports compared to what we used to get back in the day, which was a page or two, sometimes five. Todd Helton, professional hitter, like you said, could rip one all the way down the left field line and turn around, rip the next one down the right field line. Amazing bat control. Where's that today? Good question. Uh, I'm not a hundred percent sure where that is, to be honest with you. I think that the analytics of everything have changed swings a lot because of they, we now understand that, um, and I think it's something that everybody's always known, but it's more quantifiable now that obviously if you hit the ball hard and on the line you're going to be more successful. And I think that it's, that's probably an easier thing to do more to the pull side than it is to do to the opposite field. So I think that we kind of get stuck in that at times that we really think about hitting the ball so far out front sometimes that we end up getting a lot more pull swings than, than probably used to happen, you know, 15 years ago. Right on. Right on. That's, that's the best answer we've had to that question yet. <laughs> <clears throat> Definitely the best. 
usually it's, I don't know, guys can just pull balls, <laughs> you know, that's what we normally get. So that, that's a great question and a great answer. So we, we've talked about the most athletic guys you've seen. Who is somebody that when you came to the plate, whether it was the minors or the majors, that you just dominated as a hitter? Hmm. Um, at the big league level, it was probably Jason Schmidt, right-handed pitcher in San Francisco. Um, I don't know why. For some reason, I was very – I had a lot of success against him. Um, I I don't know what it was. I mean, he threw hard. He had good stuff. But for some reason, it was just one of those guys that was a guy that I saw the ball well off of and had success. Nice. Now, flip that question over. Who was the one guy you didn't want to face? Brandon Webb. Sinker ball, Arizona. Uh, I think I was like one for 17 or 18 in my career against him. Got a hit like my first or second at bat. And I don't even know if I hit a ball out of the infield the next 15. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, he was he was pretty dirty in his career until he ended up with that shoulder injury. I mean, he yes. really had something his going there. Was, his sinker was incredible. He had, I mean, he would throw one that had a lot of run, and then he could throw it also to where it was almost like a straight down. To it was, he was, he had good stuff. I, I he, did, I just, for some reason, killed me. Nice. So, as a catcher now, now that we talked about a pitcher that you faced that had just absolutely nasty stuff, as a catcher. Who is somebody that you caught that had the nastiest stuff? Um, Ryan Anderson had really good stuff. He was a high pick for the the Tigers, right-handed pitcher, mm-hmm. threw really hard, had good split, good slider. Um, his stuff was off the charts good. Um, a Taiwanese guy that was with us in the Rockies organization, Chin Wei Sal, um, he was a starter – when I caught him in the minor leagues and then when we got to the big leagues, he was a, a reliever. And as a starter, he was just a guy that in the first couple innings was 90, 93. And then in the third inning, he was 93, 95. And the fourth inning, he was 95, 96. And he just got better as time went on. And he could, he could throw the ball wherever he wanted. He had command. He had four pitches that he could throw for strikes. But then as he, when he got to be a reliever, all of a sudden now it's a one inning stint and he was throwing hundred miles an hour with command. So it was, he was a fun guy to catch with really, really good stuff. And that was, you know, that was at a time where a hundred miles an hour was not every guy on the mound like it is now. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. <clears throat> definitely. Especially when you bring up somebody like Ryan Anderson, who was bringing in 100 to 103 in college when he was at Rice, man, that, yes. that guy was dirty. Was yes. Straight up dirty. Yeah. So B Sims asked question, what catcher did you look up to? Um, growing up, I enjoyed watching Benito Santiago catch. Um, I wish I could have thrown like he did, but <laughs> there weren't very many people in the game that could. Uh, but actually I was very fortunate. I don't know. He must have been 183 years old at the time, but my first year in the major leagues in 04, he was actually playing in San Francisco. So I actually got to meet him and see him and talk to him a little bit. So that was kind of a cool moment as a guy, you you know, you kind of admired growing up watching to get a chance to play against him and meet him. And, and I, I mean, I think the obvious Pudge Rodriguez is probably another obvious one, but I really enjoyed watching Benito catch. Nice. So our guys like to have fun. They asked uh, if you would have faced me, would it have been the longest home run you ever hit? Uh, I have to have some have to have some background information. Left-handed pitcher, correct? Left-handed pitcher, yes, sir. How hard did you throw? Um, I averaged ninety-three to ninety-five. I topped out at ninety-nine. Nope, I would have never. T- I wouldn't have touched you. Ninety-two was my speed limit right-handed. So no. <laughs> left-handed maybe but as a right-handed hitter no no if you got not if you got above 92 93 that was that was above my speed limit right on right on so mike still asked another good question here he goes back to the series side as a catcher did you ever try to get payback against the umpire i personally did not no um 
I tried and I was taught to kind of have good relationships with those guys. So I never tried to get back at a guy. I mean, I've had, I had many stern conversations, but never did anything to try and get payback on a guy like intentionally miss a pitch or anything like that. Yeah. Right on. So in your opinion, since you're a minor league catching coordinator, been doing that for a few years, as well as coaching in the minor leagues, as well as being a developmental coach for team USA as well. Do you teach your guys to cultivate that yes. relationship yes. with the umpire and to keep it going during the game? Or do you tell them just, you know, give the quick hello and then just go to business? Well, what's your opinion on that and how it should be done? I We definitely encourage our guys to develop relationships because as players, especially in, in the professional game, you tend to have the same umpires from level to level to level to level. So if you can build a little bit of a relationship and have a little bit of a, be able to conversate with those guys over the course of time, I mean, it may not show up right away, but I think it definitely helps, you know, helps you be able to work with those guys because what ends up happening is, is you can talk to them about pitches and how you're receiving a ball and where that pitch is located and you can have honest conversations with them and you can help each other out. They can help you with, you know, our guys with how they're receiving the ball or where they're setting up or where the pitches are located. And we can help them too, because we always tell our guys be honest with them too, because when they ask or you ask, or, if, you know, you, cause you have umpires that will ask you, Hey, where'd you have that? Did you think that was a good pitch? Well, we encourage our guys to be honest. If it was a ball and they called it a strike, tell them, no, I, we, I thought that was a little off. Or, you know, hey, I thought that one was a strike. So you build those relationships so that you can help them in that regard as well. Right on. So what do you tell their, tell your guys when it comes to Angel Hernandez? <laughs> Just, Angel, how you doing today? I think that's about as far as I would have to take that one. <laughs> that's awesome. Now, when you were playing, did Joe West ever try to give you one of his country CDs? Oh, another crazy thing with Joe West. So when I, in 2000, for some reason, Joe West liked me. I don't know why. Well, I kind of have an idea why later, but it, right away, Joe West liked me. And Joe West is kind of the guy that would always test everybody to see how they were going to react. He, you know, he would intentionally for a young guy would come up, he would intentionally ball the pitchers, you know, ball pitches just to see how the pitcher would react or call balls off the plate. But for some reason, Joe's wife is from Indiana. Okay. So every time I would get back there and Joe was behind the plate, he would get back there. All right, Indiana connection today, baby. So it was always like, yeah, Joe, let's go get this, you know? So, we, That's awesome. You know, I tried to play that one up as play that card up as much as possible. He never offered me one of his country CDs, but I felt like we were in a good place just because of his wife and where I was born. That's awesome. What a great connection, man. <laughs> you got Joe West on your side. You're doing good. You're doing yes. good. Especially when he's the crew chief. You know, he's <laughs> he's got your back. Yeah. Three Joe. Yeah. That that's great. So now, when you see in the last last week or two, we've seen the uh, rollout of the automated strike zone in the lower levels. What's your take on that with your guys? Because for the last good 10 years or so, you've seen the evolution of pitch framing and guys that are amazing with their handwork and been a skill that's been learned over these last 10 years and now with the automated strike zone we're gonna we're losing that so i think i have mixed feelings on this one um first of all i don't think umpires and i'm probably in the minority here i don't think umpires get enough credit for how good they really are um there was actually because we were looking into this one year, must have been 2019. So there was an article written in some, I think it might have been like the Harvard Business Review or something about 
umpires and the older mm-hmm. umpires versus the younger umpires and how many pitches they missed. And the, the article was titled umpires miss whatever that I want to say it was like four, 40 some thousand pitches. Okay. So they made it seem like it was this exorbitantly large number of pitches that umpires missed. Yeah. Well, when you go Until back, you realize how you, many pitches they're thrown a year. Exactly. And it was almost 700,000 pitches are thrown a year. So these guys are correct like 94% of the time. And I don't think that they get enough credit for how good they really are. I mean, if you stand back there and guys are throwing 100 miles an hour with, you know, crazy sliders and curveballs and splits and all of this stuff, and you're don't have any idea what's coming and you're trying to call balls and strikes, I think it's a lot more difficult than what it seems in the box on the screen on ESPN and MLB network and all that makes everybody an instant expert on what the strike zone really is when those boxes are kind of offset and they're not even truly really what the strike yeah. zone is. Yeah. So uh, from, anyway, the, from all the that- graphic and TV side of that, by the way, everybody, those boxes are coming from a sideways angle. They're not Correct. dead on in center field. They're either over off left field or the left center side or the right center side. That's Correct. not straight on. So when you see some of those pitches in those boxes, it's not even close. Correct. So all that said to say that I'm not a huge fan of the automated strike zone. Um, I think that technology wise, we're still probably several years off just because of the delay that happens. And they're attempting yeah. to, make some adjustments to it because in the fall league in 2019, they used it at uh, one of the stadiums and for some of the games there. And it was awful because guys were throwing curveballs that were basically landing on the back point that were called strikes because they're clipping the bottom of the strike zone at the front of the plate when they're going down. And those are considered strikes. So right. they're trying to make adjustments to that, but I think until they can figure out a way to make it a 3d strike zone in this track man hawkeye system whatever they're going to use i think it's going to be difficult to get a real feel for what it's going to be so i hope they don't because if that happens too i feel like pitchers are going to continue to dominate even more because now you're going to have Mm -hmm. a bunch of funky deliveries where guys are really super crossfire and they're just trying to clip the very corner of it and it's going to going in the opposite batter's box and i just think i think there's too many variables that aren't being seen when they start talking about this. Yeah. And, and pitching at that point almost becomes throwing darts instead of actual pitching when you're and they already for complain about spot. guys not being able to throw strikes anyway. What's it going to be like when they're trying to clip the edge of the zone, you know? So. Yeah. And, and especially as we've seen a lot of, a lot of teams start to bring up young guys who just throw overly hard and have no idea where the ball's going. We've started to see that trend over the last three years there's some guys come up that just absolutely have no clue where the ball's going. And, you know, 10, 15 years ago, a lot of those guys' careers died in rookie ball and a ball because they could never throw a strike. And now, you know, 103, 104, well, you get run up there because fastball's king right now. So that's, that's a little scary. And as a catching coordinator, that's got to be horrible for you to work with too. You know, it is. You got, I mean, it can you be. got your guys. It can yes. Yeah. It can be tough. That's no um, fun you know. being a catcher behind the dish. <laughs> it, it can be challenging at times when stuff like that happens. Yes. Yeah. And just to tell you, you know, 20, 20 some years ago, I'll tell you a good story. Me and JD were talking about this backstage before the show. One of my first experience throwing to a catcher who is now the bench coach with the Atlanta Braves is Sal Fasano. A freshman in college, Sal had just come back from playing in the Midwest League, had an all-star year, 30-plus home runs, was throwing guys out left and right. I get to throw a bullpen to minor league player. I made the mistake as I was going of – ramping up and ramping up and wanting to show a little more and show off a little more and then show off a little more. And it was going good until the one time I decided to bury that fastball on him when he's just down there in some shin guards, no face mask, no nothing. Let me tell you, 
he threw the ball back at my ankles as fast as I threw it to him. And I ate dirt on the mound really quick. And he said, welcome to baseball, buddy. (laughs) And a bunch of other choice Italian words to go with it. Yes. So, and those, those were the good days. I don't know. I don't know if guys get away with that one nowadays. Uh, not as much. Uh, it has to be something really egregious for for me to inform our guys to try and hit a guy in the shins. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I and I didn't mind it. It it taught me a great lesson at that time. You know, I don't need to show off throwing strikes and letting him see how much my pitches move and that I could actually control stuff. It meant a lot more than how hard I can actually throw it to him. So, you know, it was a good lesson for me to learn. I'm, I'm not saying it wasn't, but, you know, I'll definitely tell you the catchers, they ran the show back in the day. <laughs> yes, I agree. Mm-hmm. You know, you got to be on that end. You got to run the show. So kudos to you for that one. Definitely. So you've coached in multiple leagues. You've, Coach with Team USA, you've been a minor league roving coordinator and overall catching coordinator. So far, what has been the most enjoyable role role you've had on the coaching side of the game? Uh, I I think they all have different things. I really enjoy with where I am in my life now with my family being the coordinator because I'm able to make my own schedule. I can actually get to events that I've missed my entire life, like birthdays and graduations and anniversaries and different things. So I like coordinating because of that ability to do and go and be with my family uh, and be around things that I've never, you know, I've got, I missed a bunch of stuff, you know, in their, in the beginning of their lives. So that part's good. Um, I enjoy seeing all of our players and kind of building relationships with a lot of different players I Mm -hmm. miss as a coordinator, I miss teaching as much because we have, we, we are very fortunate in our organization that we have um, people with catching backgrounds at all of our affiliates. Uh, At least one of our coaches does. So when you go into an affiliate, it's not necessarily taking the catchers and doing drills with them the whole time. It's more kind of helping the coach and talking to them and doing, it's more of a, can tends to be more of a supervisory role at times. So I kind of miss the teaching aspect of it. But one of the most fun things I did as an, as an affiliate coach was in double A um, one year, we had a, a really, really good team and we clinched really early. So I convinced the manager to allow me to manage like the last, we had about maybe 15 or 16 games left in the season. So I asked him if I could manage all the way up to the last series of the year. So maybe 12 or 13 games and, that was probably one of the most fun times I had coaching was actually managing and running the team and doing all of that and setting the lineups. And obviously he had final say in everything, but I was able to write the lineups out and he would agree to them. And that was fun. That's awesome. <clears throat> that, that had to be a good time. Definitely. Yeah. For sure. And then he let me do, he so, let me do it all too, like run the offensive game from third and do all of that. So nice. So bus rides, better as a player or as a coach? Uh, Suck as both. (laughs) (laughs) Yes, sir. Yes. Worst bus ride trip. Oh. Um, hmm. Probably somewhere in the Pioneer League. Probably one of those overnight... Idaho Falls to Butte, Montana, 12 or 13 hour Johnsons that you get in that league out there. Nice. Anytime you have yeah, a night my, game, my... Anytime, you, anytime you have a night game and then you have to ride the bus and it's daylight when you get off the bus, that's a crap bus ride. Yeah. We had one of those when I was in uh, the New York Penn League, leaving Erie and ended up in uh, Pittsfield, Massachusetts. Mm. So. That was one of those overnights where we left after the game was over. And yeah, the sun, the sun was definitely up when we got there the next day. That that was no fun. Yes. And then we played that night. Of course. So, 
it's even even better you know nothing like 12 13 hours on a bus go to the hotel for an hour and a half and then go to the field and play yeah exactly <clears throat> Living that glamorous minor league life. That's right. Making all that money and living the dream. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I talk about that too, man. I, I remember I remember the first check after paying the clubby, paying, paying for my team insurance and uh, all the other fun dues that came out and cashed it at the bank. And I'm looking at a two-week check going, wow, 254 bucks. This, this, is, this is awesome. <laughs> No wonder yeah. I got a quarter beer night every night. <laughs> exactly. Where can I? Where Where are the three for ones at in New Orleans? <laughs> yeah. Oh man. Thank God I played in a couple college cities because that that made it way more tolerable. Towel. Oh boy, I can't talk. Tolerable on the uh, pocketbook. What little of one there was when I was doing right. that. Man. Yeah, I couldn't imagine doing that in a big city, making the uh, awesome money, awesome, awesome money that we made. You know what? You it's, found ways to make it. You found ways to make it work, though. I mean, it is what you know. Oh hell yeah! Oh yeah! So Buy, buying some world. cheap food to take on the road, adding that extra roommate, and you know, yep. having six guys in the house that probably only or an apartment that only needed two. Yeah, make it work. Make it work. Absolutely, absolutely. And it helps if you have guys that know how to cook. Mm-hmm. Stretch that money even farther. Yeah. So minor league ball. You got any crazy off field stories or away from baseball that, that happened? Hmm. So it's an off field story, but it's so we were in I was in double A in uh what year was it? Two thousand two. We are in um, Sevierville, Tennessee, and we're at the hotel. And it's we're in North. So we're playing out. We're in Zebulon as the team that we are. So we're going on the road, and we're on the road in Sevierville playing the Tennessee Smokies. And right, worst idea in the history of anything: putting a team hotel with a bunch of dumb young guys beside a fireworks store. Um, So yeah, it wasn't a very smart idea. So we spent some money and bought a bunch of, bunch of fireworks and we're shooting them off. And it was like, so it was obviously close to the 4th of July and they were, we were shooting them off in the parking lot. And um, a few people in the hotel were not very happy that we were doing that. Um, And one of our guys, it was, so there was like the hotel was, up here and then there was like a a little bushy area and then a basically like a generator type thing and then it drops off back down towards like a little ravine down there one of our guys has got the fireworks in his hand and he's standing back but we nobody knows he's back there behind the bushes Mm -hmm. and he stands up on top of this power thing and with the fireworks in his hands just standing there like this and they're just shooting out of his hands screaming at the people that are pissed that we're shooting fireworks off (laughs) so they call the police obviously and then we have a couple of guys that that go down and hide in the like little storm drain thing and guys and you know so guys are scrambling all over the place but yeah he jumped up and he was saying a few things he probably shouldn't have been saying to those people and what a bad idea that was yeah, the, the minor the minor leagues are filled with all kinds of those stories, all kinds of them. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, yeah. We we stayed in a hotel one time in uh, outside St. Catharines, playing one of the Blue Jays affiliates. And the hotel, it's all you could probably ask for. I mean, it had it had the huge professional bowling alley in it. It had a fine dining restaurant. It had a huge bar. It had another sports bar. You mix all that stuff going on with a bunch of guys who are in Canada, and the exchange rate that day. If you know that, you probably know this from going over there enough. You get to pay the lowest rate of the day on the exchange, and that that day, it was it was eighteen cents to the dollar. And we all knew that. <clears throat> 
oh shit show when it came to the bar because everybody was just running tabs on their on their credit cards because that's where you're guaranteed that rate so oh man yeah we got our asses handed to us the next day because i don't think there was a single guy that wasn't puking all morning (laughs) oh yeah good stories like that yeah definitely so Bourbon. You said you've been getting into the bourbon. Your wife got you a bourbon of the month going on for birthday, or was that an anniversary? It was birthday, yes. Right on. So what was the bourbon that got you into the bourbon and whiskey game? Um, I think probably first one was, I think it was a Four Roses maybe. I think it was probably a four roses. We were um, actually, uh, it was about five years ago uh, when we, you know, was when I was with the Yankees, um, the one of the pitching coordinator and, and another guy that was a hitting coach in the system, we kind of all hung out all the time. And the pitching coordinator, you know, kind of had gotten into bourbon a little bit prior to us. So it was, you know, we were over at his house and, so that's kind of where it all started. It was probably four roses and 10 cup, probably were the first couple that I was getting into. Nice. 10 cup. That brings back memories from uh, Memorial Day. It was part of a stream with uh, 10 other channels and the uh, bottle of 10 cup might have got passed around for bottle chugs. Nice. An experience I, you know, I, like I will never cup. forget. It's, it's a good, che- it's a good low price one to kind of go out and just hang out with. Yeah, you can get in trouble with that one. You can get yes. in trouble with it. There's there's no worries on how much you drink of that one when you go out. So now that now that you've got into this, you've been going, having some different choices every month. What it what's the daily pour for you this time? Like like if you had to choose where you're at now, what would be your daily pour if you had to pick one? Mm, Breckenridge is probably my favorite right now. I, I, I really like Breckenridge. It's probably my favorite one. Um, I do when I when I was doing all this. I they, they had I had a blade and bow that was really good. I like blade and bow. Um, hmm. I, I, you know, I had a whistle pig. I wasn't. It wasn't really. I think it was the ten maybe, and it was it was okay, but it wasn't one of my favorites that I've had. Um, what else has been good? I would say Breckenridge is probably my number one right now, though. If I were going to go get, if I were going to go out and pick any bottle, that's probably what I would go with right now. Right on. So now that you've been in the game, are there any bottles or unicorn bottles out there that you're searching out and you want to try? And if you found it, you'd grab it up instantly. Uh, no, I, I don't think I'm that f- advanced into it yet. I think that right now I'm still kind of working around a whole bunch of just trying a bunch of different ones and see where i'm at i i have a hard time as as much as i like it i still like would have a hard time coming up a a decent amount of money to go get a like a nice unicorn bottle you know i i would have a hard time spending three or four hundred dollars for a good bottle of bourbon right now still i like to stay in that it's like you know 50 to about 110 dollar range typically you can get a lot of nice bottles in that range. You can yes, even score sure. the unicorns if you find the right place that sells them at MSRP. You you can score those bottles because that's where they should be priced. There's not too many that fly in under, you know, fly in over that unless the hype's there and stores are marking them up. Like we, I, I saw some today that, you know, on the shelf when they come out, they're – Fifty nine ninety nine bottles, and I saw a couple stores today that had a mark for seven ninety nine when I was in the city in Chicago. So, ugh, it's sad what some stores will do. But you know, yes. at the same point, that same bottle was released at another store for a store pick that was all the way on the other side of the city, which I would have been on that side because they had them for fifty nine ninety nine. You know, <laughs> would have loved to pick right. one up, but not paying seventy nine or seven hundred ninety nine. Fifty nine ninety nine. I'm all in. Right. I'm all in. Definitely. Yeah, the bourbon game gets crazy like that. So, 
I'm going to switch it up once again. What would be the best advice you give to a mom and dad or a player that is aspiring to be a professional baseball player? Uh, I think it would probably be don't let anybody tell you that you can't do it. Uh, always believe that you can. I, I grew up in a really small town. I grew up in a town of 6,000 people and in Indiana, which baseball in Indiana is way better now than it was, you know, 25 years ago. Uh, and they, you know, I, I was given an opportunity to do it. So I would always tell, <clears throat> tell people, don't let anybody tell you you can't do it because you can. If you put in the work and you, you're going to be seen. There's, it's the way the world is now. If you're good enough, you're going to be seen. You don't have to spend hundreds of thousands of dollars going to the PG World Wood Bat Winter Super Swirled Series, you know, whatever the heck it's called, because they're going to find you. Just believe that you can do it and follow that dream. And, you know, obviously you have to put the work in, but don't ever let somebody tell you that you can't do it no matter where you're from. Right on. Yeah, I didn't come. I didn't come from a big town either. Like uh, when I when I left here, we were we were still in the three or four thousand range. Um, now, twenty five years later, and moving back here, I think they just passed the ten thousand range for the city. But you know, like like my high my high school was fifteen hundred kids when I was there. You know, so well, that was three you times. Can still that was three times seen. my high school. My high school had yeah. five hundred and forty students in it. Nice. Nice. Yeah. That's getting it done. You're winning state championships with 540 people in the school. That's awesome. So coming through high school, what was the best piece of advice that you ever got from a coach? Uh, you know, I, I think one thing that I always not necessarily from a coach, but back to it kind of ties back into a question that was asked earlier about uh, Piazza or Bench. Um, I was told when I was really little about a quote that Johnny Bench had when he was young. And it was when he was in the fifth grade, they asked me what I wanted to be when I grew up. And I said, professional baseball player. And everybody laughed. In the eighth grade, they asked the same question. Everybody laughed again. By the 11th grade, nobody was laughing anymore. So That's I kind of, awesome. that was kind of something that always stuck with me throughout that, you know, when people ask, that's what I always wanted to do. And they're like, ha ha, you're from a small town, in Indiana, and nobody's ever going to find you. And then kind of, as it went along, that was kind of used as motivation to, to prove everybody wrong. Nice. So, <clears throat> As this game keeps on evolving and everything keeps on changing, what do you think the next big trends are going to be in the game? You're you're on the coaching and coordinating side, so you kind of have to be able to predict certain things that are going to come along the way. Oh, you know, and you guys are always looking at least a year, sometimes two or more years out. What's one thing that you think is going to be very important? And is going to change in the game over that next 18 to 36 months. I honestly believe that the analytics are here to stay, but I think that they, we're going to see a trend to an extent of it kind of evolving back a little bit to some of the things that happened before analytics came into the game. I think we're going to see a much better blend of the two together uh, moving forward. I, that's that's kind of how I think this game is so cyclical with how things happen. Um, you know, I think, you know, you look back at it and the whole elevating the ball and doing all that stuff, Ted Williams was talking about that in the 1940s and 50s and 60s. So I don't think that a lot of the stuff's new. I just think that the ability to quantify it's new. And I think now that we have a better understanding of it, we're going to be able to kind of, find a better way to meld it together and get the best of both worlds. Right on. Mar Marty says, learn how to lay down the damn bun. You know, yes, I would agree with you at times, 
but I don't like to give up free outs. Now, what if everybody's standing on the uh, right side of the field and the left side's open? I, if, I, if you can steal a base and you, you're it's part of your, I would say go for it. Do it. So I agree. I think that so it's why don't we see that one more? Because they don't pay for guys to lay down bunts. Right on. So I'll give you a good one. You said that, and that that's spot on when it comes to contracts. So what do you think of somebody like Javier Baez who's in a contract year and at the beginning of the season they're up 10 runs in the game and he decides he's going to hit left-handed while he's in uh, 0 for 15 slump in a contract year? I think that's his – I mean – do I don't necessarily agree with it, but if he wants to cost himself money, that's his choice. Right on. No, He's his own enterprise, right? Team, yeah. If you're coaching the team, you see him going up there to do that. Are you stopping him and saying, hey, you better think about that? Or are you just letting him do his uh, thing? That's a hard question to answer. I think that you have to give the players some freedom to do some of that stuff. If you're managing and you want to continue to keep the clubhouse, but at the same time, I mean, look, it's not like he's going up there with just an absolute garbage left-handed swing. Let's be honest. I mean, it's not a horrible swing. Um, So I think that's a hard, I don't know. I don't know how I would react to that. I honestly think that, there would probably be a part of me that would be pissed about it because it's kind of making a mockery of the situation. But at the same time, like I said, you have to give these guys some freedom to do and be who they are because that's what this game is begging for really from the fan base, especially they want these guys to have personalities like, you know, NFL and NBA and these guys have personalities and they do those types of things. Does it get out of hand sometimes? Yes. But I think that that's kind of what the younger generation is yearning for out of the game is to have some personalities and do those types of things. Right on. So next question. <clears throat> we got the seven inning doubleheader. I bring this one up because I have the pitching background. So Bumgarner throws the seven inning complete game, throws the no hitter slash just a complete game, not a no hitter. Can we still call something? Can we give somebody a complete game in the stat column, which they did and still call it, not call it a no hitter in your mind? No, to me, that's a no hitter. You, you can't control the variables that were given to you. You did what you were, you know, you did what you're to me. And, and unfortunately that happened against our major league team. <laughs> so, I should have – I think it's a no-hitter. I mean, the Rays just did it last night too, I think, in a doubleheader. They had five right. guys combined to throw no seven no-hit innings. It's not mm-hmm. their fault that the game was seven innings. They, You know what? Right. They were given – that's what they were given, and that's what the, that's my opinion. I think it should be a no-hitter. Right on. Now, what do, you, what do you think – I mean, we just talked about, you know, seeing some more flair in the game, some more excitement, things like that. What do you think about the rash – uptick in no hitters across the league this year because we've seen I, I believe three of the combined no hitters this year we've also seen at least 10 other no hitters already this season so do you think that's helping the game do you think that's hurting the game uh, I mean it probably hurts the game I would imagine because I don't think fans necessarily want to see that I think if you're a, a baseball person or a baseball purist you actually enjoy seeing that because it, I mean, it takes a lot of things to happen correctly for a no hitter to happen. I mean, I don't Mm -hmm. think people realize how difficult that can be. I mean, it takes a lot of luck of balls being hit at people and things like that. But I also think it kind of plays into where the game is now and the three outcomes, the walk base or the walk homer and the strikeout. So I think they right. both play into it, and I think that that's why fans in general probably don't like it as much. But it's tough. I mean, the game is tough. There's pitching is better than it's ever been. I mean, you have you don't face guys more than once or twice a, a, a night. And coming from a hitter's perspective, it sounds silly because growing up, you don't care who's on the mound; you just see it and hit it. But as you get older, it means a lot to see guys more consistently. And when you're only seeing a guy one time 
or maybe twice, I think it beca- makes hitting very, very difficult. Right on. So you get to bounce all around the minor leagues, seeing your team's affiliates. So you get to see a lot of other players that are coming up in different systems. Can you give us three guys in the Atlanta system that we should all be on the lookout for over the next couple of years? And can you give us three other guys that are in different organizations that we should be on the lookout for? Uh, I would say in our organization, we have a guy in Rome, which is our high A by the name of Michael Harris, who is going to the future game, who is a guy that's 20 years old and having a really, really good year. Obviously, my bias would have to throw our double-A guy in there, Shea Langoliers, uh, our double-A catcher. And a third guy would be, hmm, we've got some pretty interesting arms, to be quite honest with you. Um, as much as I don't like pitchers sometimes and don't <laughs> – uh, <laughs> We have a couple of we have some young guys with some really really good arms that are going to be interesting to to see coming up. I mean, we've probably got two or three guys. I know one guy for sure that's not been very successful this year, but has had some has some good stuff. His name's Jared Johnson. He's in our low A. Um, You know, I think he's got some stuff in there eventually that's going to play out pretty nicely. Um, Let's see opposing players that I have seen that are really good. I was really impressed with. Um, a 20-year-old shortstop that's in the Royals system. His name's Michael Garcia. I think they only signed him for maybe thirty thousand dollars. He was 20, 19 or 20 years old, and he had a really—I mean, he probably had a, a you know a well above average arm. He could run, put the ball in play really well. Uh, I just saw him last week. Um, I obviously saw uh, some of the guys from the Red system pitching wise. They have a guy, a lefty by the name of uh, Lodolo, who was unbelievable when I saw him pitch against our double-A team. Uh, Actually, a miniature version of Chris Sale is kind of how I would describe him. He was kind of lanky and lean and kind of a funky delivery, Um, but he was only 94-96 instead of the 97-98 that Chris Sale is. So um, he was really interesting. I saw Hunter Green, who was the one who averaged, basically his average fastball against us was 101, um, was really impressive. Um, Green, even after yes. having his elbow, his UCL replaced. Yes. Um, let me think. Who else have I seen? You know, there's a <clears throat> a guy. He's now in Double A with the Rays, but I saw him when he was in High A, who I was really, really good hitter named uh, Ruben Cardenas. He's with the okay. Rays. Um, I was really impressed with him and his bat and his ability. He actually reminded me of. And I'm not saying he this, he's this guy, but like his mannerisms and how he stepped in the box and stuff reminded me of JD Martinez. So okay. it was uh, it'll be interesting to see how those guys move forward and do all and and go from there. But those are just a few guys that I've seen this year. Yeah, for sure. Daniel H out of Texas, who got to watch you play when you were with the Tulsa Drillers and some other minor league teams, asked, how many guys don't really get an opportunity that probably could have made it that you've seen in your career? I think once you get to the upper levels of the minor leagues, all those guys, well, on a 25-man roster, I would say probably at least 15 to 20 guys probably could make it and play and don't get, you know, and some of those guys don't get an opportunity. So I think that that's, Matt, as far as a percentage, I don't know, but I mean, there's definitely a a decent number of guys that probably could make the big leagues that don't ever get an opportunity just because they're never in the right situation at the right time. And a lot of it, as, as you know, is just timing. I mean, you can be, yeah. unless you're just an absolute stud, A lot of it is just being in the right place at the right time when a need is presented and then taking advantage of that opportunity. 100% for sure. So that be said, right place, right time. We talked about it a little bit earlier at the beginning of the show. We've got the reduced overall rosters of the teams. We got the reduced draft. So do you think there's more right places, right times for these guys than there were for us 20 years ago? Or do you think it's still the same? 
Uh, I think at the upper levels, it's probably more right. It's probably the same. I think as what's going to happen with the reduced number of teams and the reduced draft numbers is what's going to happen is the guys that take a little bit longer to, to develop are going to get weeded out where you don't really see as many of those guys that are in an organization kind of tooling around between the chain link league and they're in the short season, low A teams for four or five years anymore, because you don't really have that time luxury of having all these extra teams. So I think those are the guys that are going to get squeezed out more than other guys, just because you're going to have to make decisions on players much more quickly than you would have had to in the past. Definitely. Tim Evans brings up a good one. When we talk right place, right time. He brought up, Patrick Wisdom, as Tim's a big Cubs fan, and that guy just burst on the scene out of nowhere, had, hasn't had all the notoriety coming up through the minor leagues, even when it comes to the Cubs' top 10 prospect lists in the minors. And that guy came out with a fire early this year, and he's still he trucking along. Is he still having a really good – I mean, I know he had like eight or nine homers in his first – like. 15 or 20 like yeah. some crazy 20 games or something and is he still really i haven't looked lately i know the cubs went through a little slide if you will over the last couple of weeks yeah slightly a slide he's still hitting 275 he's got 11 home runs okay 18 run or 11 home runs 21 rbis two stolen bases rocking a 1.4 war and he's well, he only down a little bit but still doing well yeah it's good yeah Earned two at bats, eleven bombs, twenty-one ribs. That's not too bad. He's got a nine seventy-one OPS. That place. Yeah, yeah. Right place, right time, definitely for him, Tim. You know, I think otherwise we probably wouldn't have known who he is. Correct. Not the way we see it right now. <laughs> so Mike Stahl's going to ask this question. He's asked other guys who uh, have <laughs> had Rockies affiliations with us. Are the Rockies the worst run franchise in professional sports? Uh, I'm going to plead the fifth on this one just for the fact that I played in the organization. Well, if you remember is that, Jason is that Hirsch. A good, is, is that a good comment? Yeah. yeah. You remember Jason Hirsch? <laughs> yes. Yes. He, he let that one fly and said he agreed. I'll just let you know that one. <laughs> Yeah, he said well, it, he said I might need a, job, I might need a job at some point. But he had to I admit, might. it just wasn't going well. I might need a job at some point, so I'm not going to go there right now. <laughs> yeah, he's not. He's over on the radio side of things doing some pregames, so he's not, right. he's he's not actually coaching too, or anything right? like that. So Doesn't he do something I, with a facility up there too? Yeah, he's got a facility called Fast up there. Okay. Um, so he's working with a lot of younger players. Right. So. Yeah, he's on he's on that on that different side of the game right now compared to you still being in the game Correct. at the professional level on the coaching side. Yes. So I'm right there with you. And what's this one? Daniel H. Our, we aren't ESPN. <laughs> what's he doing? <laughs> Todd Helton said the organization sucked. I'm kidding. Daniel, you're you're trying to bait us into some good stuff here. I'm not gonna say any team sucks or the organization sucks. <laughs> <laughs> and I played. I played in the pirate system, so me that's all you need not, to know. Not man. currently. But, not currently. When yeah. maybe when I retire, hopefully in many many years, I can go back and answer that question. Right on. So this has been a great interview, man. I've loved speaking with you. I don't want to take too much of your time. We're getting to our normal spot here. We hit about the hour and a half mark. Is there anything you want to throw out there to any kids or just anybody in general that is some great advice going forward? I would just say dream big and just don't and don't ever stop trying to achieve your dreams. I think that all of us, actually, probably the vast majority of us that get an opportunity to play professional baseball, but that was our dream and we weren't going to let anything get in our way and just don't let anything get in your way of doing whatever your dream is, whether it's professional baseball or something outside of professional baseball. I think that that's one thing that being in this game teaches us is that you can do a lot of things that you didn't ever really think you could probably do. And if you just continue to chase it and follow it and do it, I think that you'll 
be surprised in what you can accomplish as a person and professionally throughout your life. That's awesome. That's awesome. Well, JD, I want to say thank you very much for taking the time to come out and hang out with us tonight. Talk baseball, talk some Braves, talk some developmental, you know, I, I appreciate it. And I appreciate all the guys that come out and, you know, keep on spreading the love of the greatest game there is in American sports. In my opinion, it's still the greatest, have, even yeah. if it's not my opinion. <laughs> I appreciate you rest. having me on. I'm a little disappointed. I didn't yeah. get the lingerie question tonight. I mean, I heard that that was, I know, I on, know, I, you know, guys, I, I let them know ahead of time. There might be some lingerie questions and things like that. Like, JD was ready to go. You guys dropped the ball on us, man. I mean, we got our Will Clark question. I do know that. You know, Burben was thinking about asking his Eiffel Tower question, but he didn't. You know, I'm not going to ask for you until you ask. And Shane Long, no lingerie question, no negligee. Come on, man. Well, I need you guys here. What does have you. to leave? What does have to keep the mystery out there then? Yes, yes. The mystery will live on with JD. That is for sure. <laughs> well, JD and everyone that came out tonight for another episode of Big League Bourbon, thank you very much for always coming out and enjoying the two greatest things in America, baseball and bourbon, and hanging out with me and my guests tonight. I just want to say thank you. Everyone, take care. Have a great weekend as it's upcoming. JD, keep on keeping on, man. Keep on helping these guys reach their dreams and, you know, always shooting for the sky. I wish you the best of luck and cheers to you and your family. Thank you so much for taking the time to come see us tonight. I appreciate it. Thank you for having me on. And uh, I look forward to uh, looking at some more posts and finding some more good things to drink. Hell yeah, man. I'll definitely send some stuff your way. I'll hit you up after this, get your address and we'll send some stuff your way, my man. All right. I appreciate it. Thank you very much for having me. And All right. Have a good weekend. You take care. I enjoy it. Mm -hmm. All, All right. right. Thanks, JD. Appreciate yep. it. Have a good night, man. Yep. Later. Well, everybody, like I said, thanks for coming out for another night of Big League Bourbon. If anybody wants to jump in on the backside here, I'm going to hop off here in about five minutes. But the link's up there for anybody that wants to stay on and go back on the backside of this fun and just keep on talking. Talk some bourbon fun. Talk some baseball fun. The link's posted up in the top corner of the YouTube. If y'all want to come on and hang out a little more. If not, it's been a good night. Take care. Have a great weekend.